Mark chapter 9. Scripture reads, when they returned to, with the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of the religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so that you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently on the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit and watch this, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. And he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers were growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed, and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. The murmur ran through the crowd as the people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet. And the boy stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out this evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can only be cast out by prayer. I'm going to place an emphasis on the end of 18 when the boy's father is saying, Jesus, I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirits, but they couldn't do it. Then I'm going to come down with some more emphasis at verse 28 and 29. And then it says, afterwards, when Jesus was home alone with them and the disciples, they asked him, why couldn't you cast out the evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can be only cast out by prayer. This morning, I want to focus on the subject, the secret to failure. The secret to failure. There is a secret to failure. And it's embedded through all these passages throughout this text. Peter, James, and John are with Jesus at the top of the mountain in, in the beginning of this chapter. They are experiencing what we call the event of transfiguration at the beginning of this chapter. They were at the top of the mountain and they're coming down. This is Peter, James, and John, they're with Jesus and they come down from the mountain and right as soon as they come down from the mountain, all drama breaks loose. There's an argument going on. Imagine being engaged with God 
in a peaceful time. You're hearing from the Lord. He's speaking to you clearly. He's showing you things that you've never heard of. You're just in this wow in all moments. And then you come, you come out of this place and you walk right into some stuff. That's what they're doing. They're engaged into intimate time with Jesus. God is showing them things. And then out of nowhere, they walk down. And the people are arguing. Now, some will say that they were at the mountain in the evening. So when they got down at the bottom of the mountain, it could have been morning. They're arguing at the crack of dawn. Going back and forth. Well, who's in this argument? The other disciples. So this is not James, John, and Peter. These are the other nine. They're down here at the bottom of the mountain arguing with the scribes, the teachers of religious law. These teachers, they are educated. They know a lot about scripture. But for some reason, in early in the morning, they're finding themselves engaged into arguments with other people in front of a crowd. It lets me know your title has nothing to do with your anointing. Here they are, scribes. They've been indoctrinated. They're not, they are very intelligent. They, they went through a lot to become scribes. Pharisees and scribes go through a lot to get that title. So they're well educated. But for some reason, they're up in the morning arguing with the folk. Titles doesn't matter. And then the disciples, the other disciples, are arguing with them in front of people. I'm reminded of a story of Moses when he was spending intimate time with God. And then he came down and his brother was having a party around a golden calf. Imagine being with God and hearing from God and you come down and they just partying and worshiping a golden calf. It's, we're going to worship a golden calf. They, you went from one place to another. You walked from a great time with God, a great experience with God, into some mess. And this time, the mess are the leaders, the teachers of religious law, the scribes, and they're arguing. Now, here's the argument. It's an interesting argument. The boy's father brought his son to be healed by Jesus. Let's, let's pause right there because this boy's father, I, I really like this boy's father. He, he encourages me. He knew where to take his son. Sometimes we say when we have kids, they don't come with a manual. <laughs> I like to argue that sometimes and say, yes, they did. It's in the Bible. We just got to look a little hard. I miss it sometimes too. But this boy's father knows where to take his son. And he attempts to get his son to Jesus because his son is going through some things. His son can't hear. His son can't talk. He's having violent convulsions. He's having seizures. Since he was a boy, this boy is experiencing a whole lot. And he tries to get, he tries to get his son to Jesus so that Jesus can heal his son. But Jesus is at the top of the mountain with Peter, James, and John. So who does that leave? The other disciples. And so he brings them to the other disciples and he said, my son needs your healing. Some would say, well, maybe they should have waited on Jesus. Maybe the boy's father should have waited on Jesus. 
Let's go back a few chapters. Mark chapter 6, verse 7 says this. And he called the 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two. Watch this. Giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. So the disciples have the authority to cast out evil spirits. So that throws that argument out the table, out the window. These disciples are equipped to handle this boy. This father has brought his son to a place where he expects something from Jesus. And the people that are assigned and have been given authority are there to serve him, but they can't. It's an epic failure. Imagine if people were just to come to the church and they needed healing. They needed someone to speak with. They're going through depression. They're contemplating suicide. And when they get to the place of worship, no one is able to even pray for them. Imagine a young family coming up to the church and they're saying, man, we're hungry, we haven't eaten in days, and no one is able to serve the people who came to the place of worship to the people who have been appointed to serve God's people. The disciples have failed in ministry. They failed. Scripture says they couldn't heal the boy. Their failure, watch this, their failure led to the father's doubt in Jesus. Could it be that when we fail in ministry, it could lead to other people's doubt in Jesus? When God gives us an assignment, when God asks us to praise and worship, when God asks us to preach, when God asks us to serve people, could it be that when we fail, we could be hurting other people's faith in Jesus? Their failure caused this father to doubt. How do I know that it caused his father to doubt? Because then he comes to Jesus and he says, I wanted to bring my son to you. Would you please have mercy on us and heal him if you can? Now he don't even know if he can do it. Because his assigned disciples have failed. Have you ever failed in ministry? I have. If you're in ministry long enough, you're gonna make you're gonna make some mistakes. Please believe that. No one here is perfect. We just serve a perfect God. You ever made a mistake in ministry? Imagine the effects that it had on the people that you were there to serve. That hurts. I remember one time, I, uh, I was a youth pastor. This was many years ago, and I was engaged and doing all type of things for youth activities. And I had relationships with a whole lot of youth that lived in the area in Little Rock. And I had been getting some phone calls and texts. One particular phone call came up, and I, I saw who it was, and I said, I'll call him back Sunday afternoon. It was like a Friday. Because I was engaged into some other things. It was ministry activities, but it was probably like, you know, event planning or something. When I got to church on Sunday, I was informed that he had been killed later that evening. This devastated me. Because he was just called his youth pastor. Yeah, I had over 100 youth. 
However, something on the inside of me says, what if I just had picked up that one call? Could it have changed his direction in life? I don't know. Maybe it was just a, a prayer just to encourage him. I failed. I did. I failed. We fail in ministry when we do not focus on what's important. Sometimes we can get distracted by these other little things in life. That honestly, if you think about it, sometimes don't even matter. That's what's going on in this text. These disciples have failed this little boy. And they have now caused the father to doubt. He doesn't even know if Jesus can heal his boy. Our commitment to ministry is very important. If we don't take it seriously, it could hurt someone else's life. We could cause other people to doubt Jesus if we're not careful in our commitment to ministry. Scripture keeps going. It's a failure. They couldn't do it. And then in verse 19, the scripture says that Jesus calls them a faithless people. This is messed up. Who is he calling the faithless people? He's calling the other disciples faithless people. I need y'all to see this, man. These disciples were committed to God. They made sacrifices to Jesus. They left their professions. They, they, left what they, they left everything behind to follow Jesus. They walked with Jesus on a consistent basis. And now Jesus calls them a faithless people. They're faithless. The scribes are faithless. And now the boy's father is faithless. This is my question for you this morning. Are you faithless? Have you committed any ministry failures? A better question, are you engaged into ministry? <laughs> You got to be engaged in ministry to fail. It's an epic failure. Jesus calls them a faithless people. Causes the boy father to doubt him. And the boy's father wants to believe. He really does. He even says this, I do believe, please help me with my unbelief. Now, that's the type of cry I'm talking about. That's a real cry. Scripture says he cried. So imagine tears coming out of his eyes. This is not like your, oh, I believe, please help me with my unbelief. No, this man is crying. Imagine the circumstance. He is crying to God and Jesus and saying, I do believe. I could imagine him saying, that's why I brought my son to you but please help me with my unbelief. And that is the cry I want to encourage all of us on this morning, even if we're having some doubts every now and then, just say to God, I do believe, but please help me with my unbelief. And this is what I love about Jesus, man. <laughs> Jesus fixes the failure. <laughs> And that's what he does in all of our, so I'll make sure we're clear on this. We do fail in ministry, but Jesus does fix it. <laughs> that's the beautiful part about Jesus. Yeah, I made a mistake, but Jesus fixed it. I know where my youth at. I do know that. I know where he's at right now. I know he's in heaven and not in hell. Because he believed in Jesus. Jesus will fix your failures. And that's what Jesus does in this particular instance. He fixes the failure. He fixes the mess that the disciples have made. Isn't that beautiful to know that when you make a mistake, 
Jesus will fix it. He cleans up our mess. And that's what he does in the scripture. He fixes the mess. It says it right there. Verse 25. Then he placed his hands on a man's eyes. It's right there. Yeah, 25. When Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. He corrected the evil spirit. He corrected the situation. He told the evil spirit, listen. You spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Jesus fixes the situation by correcting the evil spirit. See, this evil spirit was out to kill this boy. That's what the scripture says. He was throwing him into water and into fire and he was trying to kill the boy. Did you know, fathers, that Jesus is trying to kill your boys? I'm sorry, that was totally wrong. The devil is trying to kill your boys, my bad. Evil spirits are trying to kill your boys. I'm going to restate that because that was an epic failure. Did you know, fathers, that evil spirits are out here trying to kill your boys? Yeah. Play that one. Make sure you, yeah, play that one. Amen. <laughs> this evil spirit is trying to kill him, and Jesus corrects it because he has the power to correct it. And that's the beautiful thing, that Jesus can fix our mess. Jesus can fix our failures. And then we get to the end, verse 28. This is where I'm going to lay my hat. Afterwards, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be only cast out by prayer. Here it is. The secret to failure is when we do not pray. Let me explain this. Jesus, at the time of when the disciples were trying to heal the boy, Jesus was not physically present. He was on top of the mountain. Jesus told them, that as long as you're with me, you don't have to pray nor fast because you're with the living God. But now that Jesus is not physically present, they need to be consistent with prayer and fasting. And for a moment, their lives is flipped with our lives because we do not physically live with Jesus. And so what do you do when you are not physically with Jesus? You have to engage in prayer and fasting. That is how you are able to be successful is when you pray and fast and ask God to help you. See, some of us put prayer in a room. We put prayer in a box. So check out this building. Check out this space. The bathroom is a room in this building. Some of us may put prayer in the bathroom. What we need to understand is that prayer needs to be the foundation of the building. So every time we walk, we're walking in our prayers. Every time I take a step, I'm walking in prayer with God. I've already prayed about this step. I've already prayed about the decisions that we need to make. I've already prayed about my family. I've already prayed about working with people. I've already prayed about my business. I've already prayed about these things. We need to, the foundation needs to be centered and built with a foundation of prayer. Not a room. Because if prayer is only in a room, what are you walking on? I know I'm preaching now. give you an example of successful prayer. We find in scripture, Acts 13. 
If you're one of those Bible toting people like me and you want to see it, or I want to show it to you. <clears throat> Acts 13, verse 2. It says, one day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work which we have called for them. So after more, pray, after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. I need for you all to see this. Before they made a ministry decision, they prayed and fasted on a person that didn't have to sin. Before we make decisions in life, we need to pray and we need to fast before we start making decisions in life. Before you go off to college or before you choose what sports you want to play, before you appoint a new pastor, before you appoint a new deacon, before you appoint a new elder, before you decide to get married, we need to pray and we need to fast. That's what the scripture says. Jesus points out and he teaches them how they failed epically. I just made that word up. Jesus, uh, she showed them right then and there. This is how you failed because you failed to pray. When you are not physically with Jesus, we must engage into prayer so that we can be in tune with God. Before we make decisions in life about careers, before we make decisions in life about next steps, we need to ensure that we are engaged into authentic prayer and fasting so that we will not fail. That's my message for you. Pray and fast before every decision you make. Make prayer the foundation of your home. Make prayer the foundation of your job. Make prayer the foundation of your church. Make prayer the foundation and not the room. Because we do not physically, flesh and blood, have Jesus with us. So we need to pray and fast so that we can be in tune with him. If not, we're just depending on ourselves. God is worthy to be praised. Before I take my seat, I just want to very much encourage you not to make an epic failure in life by not making prayer the foundation of your life. God bless you. God be with you. Amen.